Good morning. My name is Mark Pearson, and I'm a professor of architecture here at College of DuPage. I'd like to welcome you all to our second spring semester event in our 2020-2021 Visiting Artist Series here at College of DuPage. This series is a collaboration between the Cleve Kearney Museum of Art and the Departments of Art, Architecture, and Photography at COD. It is my pleasure to welcome and introduce today's speaker, Paula Aguirre Serrano. Paula's Twitter bio reads, sometimes architect, passionate urban designer. She describes her studio as a research and design practice that focuses on connecting communities to design and cultivating collaborative design agency. I like to think of her work as a form of design-based community organizing. In her Overton project, for example, she addresses the issues of repurposing closed Chicago public schools. This project's part installation art, part design project, part community outreach, and it's a project that serves as a catalyst to instigate design dialogue around the difficult and politically charged topic of school closures in Chicago. So is her work architecture, sometimes urban design, community organizing, installation art, however you wanna classify it, Paula's work uses design to bring people together. It's creative, collaborative, and deeply impactful. For those of you who are listening in the YouTube live premiere of this lecture, please feel free to put your questions in the live Q&A chat box. And Paula, welcome to COD. Thank you for spending time with us today. We are so looking forward to hearing about your work and I will turn it over to you now. Thank you so much, Mark. I'm, I'm really excited and honored and thrilled to be um, virtually with you all. I feel like it's a new world. It's a, it's a different way of engaging that we all had to adapt very quickly. Um, so I'm just grateful for the space. I'm grateful for the invitation. I'm grateful for the consideration and all the, the, the work that goes behind preparing um, this uh, lecture series. Um, I'm also excited to see uh, the ones that are coming up. So um, everyone, please um, stay tuned. Um, so I, I like to begin also um, with this very important approach to the work that uh, we do at Borderless. Uh, this idea of scratching, um, you know, the, the, the approach of, of thinking that we are offering um, a service, uh, whether it's from the architectural perspective, whether it's from the civic arts perspective, whether it's from the planning perspective, I think uh, we see ourselves and, and the way that we approach uh, um, most of our work is through the value of collaboration. So designing with and not for uh, creates the spirit in, in most of the conversations that we are able um, to have as part of our, our working communities. Um, so today I, I want to talk about a few things. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to I'm gonna fly by through a few projects that I hope you find interesting, but also I think it's important to talk about the journey the journey that I've had as a designer, but also the values that are have been informing and shaping this practice called Borderless now. Uh, Borderless was founded in 2016. Uh, it's still a very young practice, but it just it, it has been an idea in the make for 10 years. So I love opening with this quote from Jane Jacobs because she was not only um, not an architect, not an urban planner, but just a citizen that decided um, that it was important to fight and to push back and, and incorporate perspectives and decision-making processes that help to shape and inform and influence our built environment. And, um, you know, a lot of the people that I work with are anyone from um, uh, young people, kids uh, that are incredibly imaginative in their visions, uh, all the way to uh, youth, uh, young adults, adults, uh, seniors. So I feel like we really work in the spectrum of thinking how design can impact everyone's lives um, and how can those um, make spaces and places more enjoyable and, and contribute to um, built environment that um, enables everyone to thrive. And uh, we, we think often of like, what are the values that shape the studio? Uh, so publicness, openness, civicness, I'm gonna talk about them through all the different project examples, but I want you to, to feel that, um, to feel that um, tone also in, in the way that, uh, that we approach the work and that I am able to present it today. 
Um, a little bit of geography, just because uh, I love maps and another shape and every shape form. Um, and um, I'm originally from a home from a town called Chihuahua, which is also the largest state in northern Mexico. And um, we are. Um, I, I moved to Chicago. Uh, and has been an experience that has shaped definitely my practice, but everything that happens between happened between Chihuahua and Chicago is 10 years. And that basically is a where uh, borderless in many ways um, cultivated a lot of the um, information that I'm gonna share today in terms of practice. So um, the ethos behind borderless is not only, um, it started only being geographic, obviously, because I have this very deep connection of my journey as a designer between the US and Mexico, but it rapidly expanded in this idea of scales, like easily understanding what happens at the scale of a person, what happens at the scale of the neighborhood, what happens at the scale of a city and regions eventually. So that, that ability to understand impact and relationships across scales, but also across culture. I think um, one of the most beautiful things that um, the United States has is its diversity. And how do we think of the bridges and how do we think of uh, the opportunities that exist um, and the richness that emerges out of, of the multicultural we don't have to choose to be one person. We can be all of them uh, and, and belong to multiple cultures as, you know, as a, as a country that is it's rooted in, in, in the richness of immigration as well. And also values and processes. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to touch about this um, multiple times. Um, so I just wanted to, to, to um, begin with those um, words um, to set the tone. It's important to um, know that Borderless has been really fortunate to collaborate in other cities. Um, we're trying more and more to expand this map into um, to, uh, all North America, including, of course, more, more cities in Mexico, uh, but also in Latin America. I feel like that, that spirit of, of um, my passion for public realm emerged in my experience from Mexico and Latin American countries, and I'm able to contrast and compare how public space in the U.S. differs from public spaces in other places. So that relationship uh, influences a lot of the work that we try to um, put forward. We lead with this idea of cultivating collaborative design agency. And what that means in principle is that um, we believe that every community has a capacity, every person has a capacity to influence their built environment. And therefore we just, uh, sometimes it's the how, how do we do it? How do we get there? How do we either organize to get together? How do we learn the design techniques or tools? How do we think of what are the needs of our community? Uh, the, the needs of community can be met through design solutions. Uh, so we, we believe that, you know, borderless as, is fortunate to collaborate in many communities, but we oftentimes we're not from that community. So how do we create the platform for um, communities in their own places, create the change they want to see? And we are just a tool. We are just uh, the support. We're just constantly thinking how are we um, design and, and create the scaffolding for others to do the work they want to do. Right after architecture school, I had the opportunity to practice in the public uh, sector. So a young architect doing planning work with, with very, very uh, fortunate opportunities, great mentors, but really having no idea what I was doing and being exposed to the public, to communities, to neighborhoods in a way that I had not uh, been trained for. Uh, so just this has amplified uh, completely the way that I think about you know, the impact uh, and social infrastructure, everything that we do, we try to prioritize our work at Borderless to be in the side of social impact, so social infrastructure, public spaces, but eventually it's not the physical space. We really wanna influence what public like uh, public life could be and should be for most of, of, of communities and how does that become inclusive? This was an exhibition that asked designers from Latin America to send us their publications. Uh, into an exhibition that was happening in Cambridge, Massachusetts. So um, it was a compendium of work that as a school that is, at least at the time in 2010, um, the, Har the Harvard School of Design was it's still very US centric, but we brought this very strongly perspective from Latin America. Uh, and one of the lessons learned here was uh, the school wasn't necessarily interested at the time to talk, talking about Latin America. We had to bring to the table the topics that we wanted to talk about as students. 
So um, this was a very early lesson on, you know, how do we not only can, but have the responsibility to change narratives and how do we can't, can we define the conversation when we feel strongly about topics um, that are not being, that are being, um, re being reductive or not amplifying the way that we believe as designers, I think as artists, we have the capacity to do that through multiple ways. Um, so this is what, um, a lot of my work started doing or focusing on when, when speaking about the border. Uh, I think I mentioned like initially the focus was the border geographically. I, I walked this line so many times in my life. This is the crossing. This is the point of crossing between El Paso and Ciudad Juarez, where one of the few, few things or landmarks that you see is the plaque from the international Border uh, Water Commission. And for me, that was interesting. Why water? Why doesn't it say Homeland Security? Why doesn't it? No, it was water that was landmarking this very specific point. And um, I've been using mapping as a way to understand scale. Um, I wanted to redefine a conversation about the border. How do we talk about a border that is about ecology? How do we talk about a border that is looking into other challenges, not only around um, crime and immigration, but we have uh, very latent issues to solve as, as, as two countries that share resources such as water. So I just started mapping. This is a watershed um, map um, that just compares and contrasts, you know, this relationship between the Great Lakes and all the, uh, the St. Lawrence Basin system, watershed system, and the Rio Grande Bravo watershed system. So I was trying to, mapping as a, as a tool to understand. I think that that will become very, very clear in, in, in some of the aspects of this presentation um, and thinking of other systems like ecology and water and how cities, specifically how we design cities in no relationship to their uh, ecological um, environment. So for me here, this, this was like, what, what can Albuquerque have in common uh, in, with Monterey? Because they belong to the same watershed, but they don't necessarily see themselves as part of the same water system. Uh, especially not in practice? Or how can Bronzeville uh, and Matamoros learn from, um, you know, Chihuahua? Very different climates, very different populations, very different circumstances, but they both have uh, bodies of water running through them. One has a river that has been channelized, the other one has um, uh, um, oxbows or resacas that are, are bodies of water uh, that used to be part of a river and, and now the water is stagnant. Um, mapping as a tool, population, again, I was just trying to understand how this territory could be read differently, how it could be interpreted differently, how does, um, you know, zooming in water systems, how does, uh, how do we learn just by mapping that, you know, water in, in countries um, and cities such as Ciudad Juarez and El Paso uh, had the opportunity, or had the opportunity to reinvent the way that they want to address these challenges and resources. But uh, these two cities have the, have the same issue. Uh, according to studies, they're going to run out of water by 2030. Uh, their approaches to solving that problem and their resources, very different. Their policies, very different. So that Juarez is just going to keep um, digging more, more wells into the ground. Extraction is the strategy. El Paso is creating a, investing in a desalination plan. Um, there's more water that could be extracted. It, we just need to go deeper. But the processes and the investment to make that water portable or drinkable are incredibly expensive. So we're not necessarily thinking of uh, like ecological strategies. We just keep defaulting to the same methods um, of extraction to our planet and our regions. And this is the, the landscape that that creates, right? That attitude to our landscape, that's what it creates. And just by documenting this and, and thinking, how do we uh, bring this different types of approaches to uh, talk with communities. I feel like all these conversations happen in national policy and, and we don't necessarily find a way to bring them. So this is my hometown. This is what Chihuahua looks like from a satellite. Uh, it's, it's very interesting because it's, it's, a, it's, a mount, it's between the mountains and the, val and the valley. So, uh, but what I was interested in is looking at what happens on the border, right? It happens in the, at the edge of the city. And uh, what happens is it's a lot of rural um, uh, or formerly rural and agricultural land. And it's been subdivided 
and it's been um, basically urbanized by the people that live there. Assembling teams, this is an interdisciplinary team of 17 students in five different universities. Mapeo was a, a workshop experiment that I started testing, uh, bringing over six institutions, including the planning agency that I used to work for, uh, and bringing designers, anthropologists, uh, ecologists, uh, planners, all students to the ground. I feel oftentimes what we, what we lack is touching base with the crowd and, and understanding who are, the, who are the publics that we're trying to work with. Um, this uh, community had seen recent investment in a community center, um, enjoyed uh, in different ways, um, kids using spaces in anticipated ways. This was just a courtyard in between two buildings that the architects have very strictly said, this is a courtyard and the kids are like, nope, this is a football field now. Uh, and they will just sneak uh, through the posts because they are small enough and they can. But how repurposing, how spaces um, are repurposed and live in public life looks different once you know people get to occupy those spaces. Um, and working with students, I feel like this was very gratifying in a way that students from a public university got to speak with students from a private university and, 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 and facilities wise, right? Um, this is a student uh, explaining zoning in you know, residential commercial zoning to uh, an eight-year-old. So that was incredibly <laughs> interesting. This, this group is learning about demographics, like how many people and what percentage age groups are in their neighborhood. So I think for me, what was very um, important is to, to think of the students being future professionals um, in, in having them not necessarily being trained through a formal curriculum, but by experience. Like this is what Mapeo workshops were, uh, a space for collaboration and creative thinking. Like how do we, how do we think creatively about the ways that we engage with community as opposed to coming to the typical town hall. Um, and um, I had the opportunity to work uh, with um, Place Lab uh, in Chicago, uh, rooted at, uh, based at U Chicago. And I was incredibly lucky to, to work uh, with the leadership of, of art, artist Theaster Gates. Um, obviously, uh, he, his work has been recognized and acknowledged everywhere. Um, and working closely with him, understanding how public critique is important and how does that become uh, a moment and a tool for um, thinking uh, collectively about spaces and places and shaping things. So I was part of this team, which was a, a, a really interesting experiment where the team had everything. It was a dream team, right? And anything that you could work, that you, you could, you need to deploy a project in a community, specifically we're working in Washington Park, in Chicago, you had a social worker, a cultural worker, an architecture, an architect, an urban planner, a real estate developer. So you had a dream team to actually um, like uh, envision, uh, execute, engage community. Uh, so, so a well-rounded team. Um, and working in primarily um, the Grand Crossing in the Washington Park neighborhood, which we know um, there's a lot of challenges in terms of dis disinvestment um, and, and as a result of segregation and racism in Chicago. But it was a, a really interesting way um, being on those spaces, learning from his practice. I really, I really like referencing this because this was game changing in, in, in my practice. Like, how do we think of arts? How do we think of imagination in a way that it's, it's not necessarily um, a limitation? But how do we think of, of rethink emptiness? How do we think imagination and gaps? So this was a, a, um, an exhibition slash activation project that I had the opportunity to co-curate. And uh, we basically uh, were thinking, how do, we, um, how do we go beyond the walls of this gallery space that sits on the corner of South Prairie Avenue and East Garfield Boulevard, which is the blue building here. There were other projects in the pipeline. Now many of them have been executed uh, or implemented, but back then there was only this corner building kind of holding all the pressure of activating that block. And we thought of an, an, as an exhibition, um, as an opportunity to create content that was meaningful and incremental, uh, interdisciplinary collaborations, neighborliness, uh, new partnerships, audience really were thinking, how do we get people to collaborate with each other? Artists collaborating with a street vendor across the street, architects collaborating with musicians, 
uh, institutions, projects, such as Southside Movie Project, that is a very academic archive and, and has been working very strongly about socializing that content, bring it as a projection in, in, in the facade of a muffler shop, of a form of muffler shop, right? So uh, how do you think of different scales? Again, you know, an object, an outdoor installation, a building that is yet to be restored, and thinking of amplifying collaborations through process, so artists and designers, members of the community, students and youth, and, and thinking of prototyping. I think something that we love is prototyping things. Sometimes a prototype is the best resource that we have to uh, not only make connections, but also think of ways in which projects may even pivot or recalibrate strongly. This is the corner of, you know, this is a, a random Tuesday. I'm saying Tuesday because I don't remember what day this was, but this was the opening night. Uh, but this is a, a, a night, uh, a random night, uh, nighttime in the corner of Washington uh, Park on on 55th and Prairie. Um, this public life doesn't really exist in Chicago and the South Side in many places. So we really wanted to test what does it mean, what does it look like, um, bringing designers and and developing um, installation work that uh, wanted to think of of something that is very signature of Chicago, such as the Bucket Boys, uh, and using that as an inspiration in partnership with a sound artist, with, a, with an artist, um, Michael Patrick Avery, uh, collaborated with, with the architects in developing this amplifying machine um, that lived, and then it was tested by, by the Bucket Boys who performed there, so a little stage situation. Um, there, also, there was also a component about sharing the plans for future redevelopment. So all these elements were growing as the exhibition uh, time frame was passing by. But for me, this is it, right? Like, how do you create things that are not museum quality, but they're beautiful enough and compelling enough that people feel like this belongs, I belong here and I can interact with, with this. Um, and so um, I'm gonna take us, I'm gonna transport us now into uh, the border. This is uh, Bronzeville uh, in Texas. Uh, I feel like you'll start tracking lessons learned from one uh, place to the other. The other thing is um, just keep thinking, like keep, keep in mind that my practice spans between civic arts, architecture, landscape architecture, urban design, urban planning. Sometimes a project is all of them. Sometimes a project just stays in a bucket. Uh, which still, you know, we try to implement um, many of these other elements that we learn along the way. This was a, a housing project, um, uh, a housing development that was um, developed in the 40s. And you see the outlier in this picture. I love it because uh, you can see the influence of urban renewal. These are small blocks in downtown Bronzeville, Texas. And this is one insertion or one intervention that was done uh, with, a, with a mindset of urbanism that was brought by urban, uh, with modernism, right? The big blocks, um, the, the big uh, garden areas, the building in the park. And um, it, it is a, um, a housing authority uh, project, obviously supported by the federal housing um, department. And, um, it pretty much looked, the, the, this is the visit that we had at the, at the beginning, it pretty much looked uh, the same way, right, that the 40s, for, that was a positive thing. The maintenance was really good, even though the structures are, the design of the structures is completely wrong. This is Bronzeville, it's uh, over 60% humidity. Imagine living in uh, a one-story building uh, that is in a city that is like 90 degrees at 60% humidity with no air conditioning system. So that was very challenging architecturally. I think there was um, this template that architecture um, took from place to place in this type of buildings. Yet the landscape you know, was doing a little bit of the work, kind of bringing shade in some of the buildings. Uh, a big issue was not understanding or not having clarity on how the, the public space works, right? Uh, some of the sh sheds and shelters. Um, and, and most of the time the space was looking like this. There was no public life. Um, you can see the pattern of development, very contrasting from whatever is um, around it. And uh, occupied currently by a 99% uh, Mexican or Mexican-American community. So uh, the, the population uh, was, had been, most of the residents had been there for their entire life. Uh, a very strong community of women that were interested in entrepreneurship, 
uh, one of the one of the outcomes of the project was creating like a small community center uh, where women could also learn about entrepreneurship and, and creating their own businesses that they already had. You know, they, they, they were cooking, they were feeding, they were starting, um, you know, um, like clothing and, and sewing. And there were already entrepreneurs that just wouldn't, weren't calling themselves that way. So this is what um, the development looked like. Very simple bars, very modern, two entries, very... And then obviously over time, the main thing that happened was the parking was being punched here and there. So everything that you see in blue, it's parking, which is crazy. And we wanted to think, what can we do? There was a lot of confusion um, around the public space. All the green, you know, it was painted in green. It was actually green, but it wasn't really utilized. And this, this, this lack of understanding or having clarity how the public space could, could be activated, utilized, we started thinking that collectively. These were workshops that we use, we use our tools to understand the space. We also talk about the issues. We talk about safety. We talk about crossing the streets. We talk about what are the types of gatherings that young people, that elder people had, what they do, what are the activities. So we workshop a lot. And uh, we partner with uh, some of the residents that were helping us to come up with concepts. We had some workshops for young people, for adults. We had a small um, kind of um, like, a sh like a small showroom where we were keeping this model. Some people were coming and modify them and see them coming up with concepts. Um, but eventually is, it was just putting the tools out for residents to tell us what they want to see and how they want us to shape the space. Um, we ended up uh, just reshaping uh, into the context, uh, the, the, the former blocks. And this diagram speaks very clearly about we wanted basically to reconnect, to reconnect, to reestablish the street grid that old towns, uh, downtowns had already worked with. Uh, we also wanted a big park, that center of public life and neighborhood life where everyone could come together and throw their block party as opposed to being on the edges of the property. Uh, and this is how eventually uh, all cut, got rendered and illustrated in a central park, a community building in pair, this idea of a paseo that could be more the cultural um, uh, element of display. Uh, and there was a closed school across the street that wanted to have a conversation and speak to some of the activities on the Central Park. So we bundled all that together. Um, and, and thinking of what other forms of housing could be here as opposed to just, you know, the one, um, the one story um, uh, template that was done before and how could we think of active, store, uh, active um, ground floors with much more retail um, and other forms of housing that would be more responsive to um, the climate of the region. Uh, natural ventilation, thinking of also more areas for infiltration, how um, the priorities of the community start taking shape. So we were just translating those um, uh, literally translating to graphics and translating them from English to Spanish is a lot of the conversations were in Spanish. And, and, you know, we were just supporting the sense of pride. I think we were just being an instrument for the community to, um, to synthesize and articulate what they already had in their, in their minds and hearts. Um, this is this project's going to take us to Detroit. Um, I'm going to accelerate the pace now because I think what, what you'll see, is it's a similar methodology. So you'll start picking patterns, but the location, we always like to think that the location um, changes uh, significantly the way that we approach things. This was a partnership with Sarah Haya, she's a landscape architect. Uh, we submitted for a competition uh, held by the department, um, the city, um, the, the Department of Planning in the city of Detroit. Uh, we were double Dutch because I was based in Chicago. She was in Detroit, so we were double Dutching most of the time. Yeah, this is before Zoom, so it was more phone call and other means of, of, <laughs> of communication that we were not super used to. Um, but this is another neighborhood. This, if you're familiar with Detroit, this is downtown Detroit. And this is a neighborhood called Morningside that it's and it, it's very similar uh, to Washington Park. So we're dealing with something uh, with conditions that were similar. The, the prompt from the city was, you know, this neighborhood doesn't have parks, public space, so, but it has a lot of vacant lots. Can we um, can we assemble land and create parks? Um, 
So, uh, and also the fabric of the neighborhood, it was incredibly rich architecturally. These roofs are just uh, so remarkable, yet you see um, a lot of border homes, a lot of need for, um, you know, basic infrastructure such as sidewalks, um, basic infrastructure for being able to take a walk in your neighborhood, but a lot of love at the same time. This was a park uh, that was called Mother's Park, and there were little snippets of, of art and chairs and just, you know, neighbors trying to make space for gathering. Uh, so this is some of the images from that neighborhood. There was a, there was a playground. Uh, you know, the playgrounds um, that are designed, obviously, based on a very specific template. They have to be gated. They have to have a door, um, a gate. Um, and they have to be separate because kids of certain age play this type of uh, playscape and the kids of this other age play in this other type of playscape. But at the end of the day, the kids are playing on the street basketball because they don't have a basketball court or they're playing on the fence. <laughs> so they're not interested in any of the play structures that were given, uh, probably because you know there wasn't really an understanding of how the kids from the neighborhood wanted to play. Um, well, so we just this was a this was a very interesting exercise of observation, just trying to pick up you know the little gestures or the a lot of the gestures of love uh, the neighbors have put together. Um, we came, uh, we wanted to ask questions more than propose solutions. Uh, we asked um, what sh what should we know about this place? So we brought models, we brought you know posters, boards, all these things that design offers as a tool to have conversations. We learn about you know what's the best place to gather, what's the what what other problems are. We learn about flooding. We learn about you know needs for um, uh, spaces for teenagers. Teenagers need spaces to to feel safe, and um, we we had assumptions about like you probably need a dog park. Uh, if you see, this is a very easy exercise as a preference, as a visual preference board, but our assumption of the dog park got completely scratched because that's the one that is like, no, 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 we don't need a dog park here. So just challenging our assumptions, creating the, the, the materials and the tools to get those. Uh, and really thinking of design, we were thinking, where do you want this board to happen? Where do you want to sit? Like really, it's an exercise of programming at the end of the day but it feels fun and engaging. And in many ways, um, trying to, uh, for us, it was trying to have conversations for us to have enough information to do um, the design work. So safety at the top of the priorities and maintenance. I think oftentimes we think of design solutions that, um, or what is important to consider with design solutions is how do we get over time maintained uh, and they can stay beautiful for uh, a long time, especially in neighborhoods that don't see a lot of uh, investment. Um, so we ended up proposing a ribbon. People wanted to walk, so they just wanted excuse to walk. Uh, this was the main idea. How do we create a, a path that is continuous? Um, how do we connect these four parcels just because uh, they're separate? But how do we preserve their identity and, and create different kinds of play? Um, and uh, so this is how the layout looks like. Um, we wanted to create a, a pathway for neighbors to, to go around the different parcels, but also something that could be very um, conspicuous and playful and, and symbolic from the neighborhood where it can have sore identity, someone can reference a place. Uh, we also wanted to prioritize safety. Uh, so there's this technique that we call pinching the corner. Uh, so at the intersection, we wanted to just modify the infrastructure, the sidewalk, the curves in order to address both the flooding through stormwater management techniques and also the safety. Uh, cars would feel uncomfortable, so um, they will slow down uh, with reduced section of that space. And these techniques are used in many other places, bias wells, infiltration areas, uh, expansion of curves like ramps are important. And the lighting strategy, I, I, there was a lot of fear. There was not a lot of comfort going outside at night and we wanted to create a path. At least the path was something that was recognizable, uh, but also lit during nighttime. Um, so this was a very exciting way to talk about programming too. What happens in each one of these patches. And the first one was a part that, this was a part that had, or the part of this part that had seen the most um, activity. Uh, people already organize themselves, but we thought, what if we bring uh, color? What if we bring seasonal approach? And these things, these this elements that we propose 
um, just become uh, painted and readapted every time of the season. So, you know, fall colors versus spring colors. Um, and this is how the, the place looks like today. This is uh, what they're called today Mother's Park. And, um, you know, we imagine this could be a much more um, protected with, a, with some kind of pavilion, uh, our streets, our street being a little bit more close to each other. Um, the other part was more of a social space, less activity, but more like esplanade, which would be more flexible, classes, games, seating, uh, moving the park, uh, like performance, something that was more open and less, um, less long area. So it could be a little bit more flexible. This other area could be more active. So this is where the existing playground was. We didn't propose to get rid of it, more so reshape it in a way that could incorporate other types of playscapes. Um, and also thinking of more natural playscapes and physical that would encourage physical activities, mounds, stomps. So this is how the playground looks like today. We propose a little bit more of movement and color and especially places for the parents to sit. I think that was a big missing part of the previous one. One of the comments that came from the neighbors was, well, we bring the kids, but we're standing all the time watching them play. So just be mindful of, you know, the kids, not all the kids come by themselves to play at the park. What are, what are the parents doing? What are the grandparents doing? What are, this, what are the siblings doing while the kids are playing? And on ecological, we wanted to think like, how can we help to infiltrate in a stronger way? So proposing a meadow, thinking of, you know, what other types of uh, furnishing and what type of planting, how can we bring color? How can we think of landscapes uh, or proposing a planting that could be um, more resilient? Um, so the palette of, of flowers like lavender and, and sunflowers that are more resistant, but also they have um, uh, capabilities uh, to repair soil and stabilize soil. So there were, there were some aspects about thinking of the landscape not being uh, a very, um, it wouldn't be high maintenance and having a pathway. So that's that's what the plan was. It was a very simple move. And we got to discuss it. This is one of my favorite photos of this project. Uh, we didn't, it was a competition. I said that we didn't win, uh, but this was one of the more remarkable moments. Uh, if you've ever been to a town hall, this is not what a town hall looks like. Usually you don't sit around a circle to talk to your neighbors. For me, that, that, that break of hierarchy, um, that talking, we're speaking with each other in a way that we were discussing design. And these are all the designers. This is not one designer. This is all designers talking about ideas and community weighing in. So this is one of my favorite photos um, and moments from that project. We did win uh, the popular vote. <laughs> there was a jury that selected the winner project, but we won the popular vote uh, or whatever that counts. I, I feel like that was a really incredible experience. Um, that fact that we were able to plan with neighbors and the side that the park is supposed to go. Um, and though I just all influences uh, this last project that I want to talk about. Um, and, and I think Creative Grounds just summarizes, brings everything together uh, that I that, that I borderless we believe in. Um, so, and we use, again, I, I, saw, I said at the beginning, I use maps as a way to understand territory influences relationships. And I also think there is um, a power in the map. Even though it's very geographic, there's a power in the map for imagining and constructing worlds. Uh, so like world making and imagining, others have done it. I don't need to introduce this map, but I think the audacity of Bookman State of Fuller and like there's other way to project. Yes, yes and. And uh, these are some of my favorite drawings from James Corner, who's also the, the author of that quote. Um, thinking of other ways of mapping, when we say mapping, we don't necessarily reference to tracing. And he talks very clearly in that text, mapping is imagining. It's, imaginative, it's an imaginative exercise. Um, and this is some of the beautiful like collages and, and art, uh, artwork that he presented as part of taking measures across the American landscape. Um, but it's also that the, the mapping paired with the, the public space. So the, how do you how do you use public space interventions in order to um, just 
invite others to imagine with you. I feel like as designers, we, we, we are well-trained and we're, we're versed in our world and in our internal training about mapping and inventing and creating, but how do you create a scaffolding for inviting everyone around you to imagine? I think especially our most impacted communities struggle with that capacity. I and mean, how do we think as designers, how do we contribute for those capacities of imagination to resurface in very strong ways? Um, this is another map. I just, I just love the idea of shifting things and, and thinking of other ways of looking at space. Obviously, I mentioned my, um, my interest in South America, but this idea of challenging conventions and paradigms, it's a, it's, it's, it's a prime effort that we do in every project. How do you, the question in place, is there another way? And the answer is yes. And then how, is the how, how do you achieve the other way? And also thinking, you know, I, I, I often feel like architecture does a really good job at training us in a way that it's very focused on the hardware. If we take the analogy of IT and technology, the hardware, we're building hardware all the time. We're not necessarily building the software. And I think that's where the invention oftentimes is. If we redesign, if we think uh, enough and collectively about how do we change processes or how do we design processes together, we get into other types of, of, of results or impact that is different from just um, enabling spaces to be built. So um, I'm very invested not only in shaping spaces, but contributing to see if there are other ways to organize how we occupy that space. Um, so this is our, um, this is the last project. This is a, collab this is a collaboration of multiple years. Uh, focused on the south side of Chicago primarily, and um, it all we it all comes from this series of maps where um, you know we're all familiar with the community areas of Chicago. We're all familiar now, even more than than before, of the level of segregation and racism that has been perpetuated through multiple systems. Uh, so, living our communities of color, our black and brown communities. Uh, concentrate on the South, concentrate on the West, and therefore reflecting in the type of quality of, of neighborhoods. Um, and this is just a legacy, right? This was not designed, this was not, this, this didn't happen yesterday or a decade ago. It's in a legacy of, of racist policies and, and, and inequities that have been shaping for decades the way that uh, these neighborhoods look like. And one of the results of that, and it's, it's the focus of this project is, is closed schools. So when I learned about it in 2015, the, the 2013 closings have happened already. And um, I, was just, I was just imagining as a designer and as someone that had worked in public service before and work in, uh, on the ground with an institution such as U Chicago, is there anything we can do? And obviously the most impacted schools were in black and brown neighborhoods. They were concentrated in communities that um, have seen uh, systemic disinvestment for decades. So oftentimes in the practice, what we do is ask questions more than generating answers. And one of the questions here is where, don't you suppose to add more resources to the under resource? <laughs> So closing schools was taking resources and obviously quantifying that, like, okay, if we need to make a case, this is, this is the planning brain, right? Um, if we need to make the case for reinvestment, like let's talk about numbers. So um, 45 schools, we did extensive research and understanding the, you know, the building area, the acreage, um, summing up 3 million square feet um, that you just don't, because you don't see them together because they're, um, uh, across 25 neighborhoods and different shapes and forms. But once you take a closer look, can you imagine what does it feel to walk in your neighborhood and look at a school that has been closed and looks like this? They're beautiful buildings oftentimes. They're buildings that were, um, that had, I mean, all schools have very intentional designs. So we like to think, what could be the next life of the school? Uh, buildings that were historic. Uh, so we started doing that, reimagining. So this is the same building. This is West Pullman School. And not only reimagining the building per se, again, this pursuit of the public space, the public life, how would that look like? Um, and that's how Creative Grounds was um, uh, started as, a, as an initiative that um, wants to 
bring elevate our design and architecture as tools for inclusive processes. In this case, it's dedicated to the closed public schools, uh, but there, you know, there are many, many avenues and many frameworks in which this um, can work. We just happen to focus on something that we thought it was evidence of, of a very, very uh, strong inequity and mapping, uh, really understanding what schools were closing, what schools uh, were being repurposed, who was buying them, doing this in an analog and digital way. So this is our, our studio, just having an inventory. So this is, this is almost like scientific research, data research, and thinking of the policies, right, that could be influenced by this work. So we all know how adaptive reuse works in buildings. Well, let's pair it, let's, let's push the bar a little more and talk about uh, programming that is about entrepreneurship and innovation, wealth building, supporting local entrepreneurs. How does this become um, a generator or, or amplifier of public life in the neighborhood? Schools in general are, um, are community hubs. So once you take the, the educational component of it, you're, something else is being taken away from the heart of these communities. And, and this is a way in which we operate often. Like we don't make a plan. Uh, we more so create a framework, something that can be revisited in multiple ways and has multiple points of entry. We can just do exhibition work, installation work, uh, you know, just try to bring visibility to this uh, in multiple places, uh, Jane Addams Whole House, um, and really looking at the character and history of this of this buildings. Um, and, and doing the inventory, it was very, very difficult to find all this information in an legible and accessible way. Um, and obviously information, access to information is everything in the 21st century. Um, so we started also prototyping. We wanted to see what it would look like in the ground, on the ground. Uh, so learning about the history of the school, Anthony Overton on the corner or like it, on 49th Street between um, Indiana and Prairie avenues um, in, in the heart of Brownsville, learning that was named after Anthony Overton, uh, and I, I, a very significant prominent entrepreneur in the Black community, not only uh, successful from the business perspective, but uh, it was a civic, civic leader owning uh, one of the most uh, prominent um, newspapers in the Black community. Uh, the school was uh, designed by Perkins and Will, built in 1963, understanding the context of that time, civil rights movements, like the aspiration of schools, um, just thinking of all the information that, if, that, that went into designing this building, um, learning about the patterns of the architecture, thinking how the architecture helped us to design spaces, not design spaces, design a process for community to come together, understanding the broader neighborhood, uh, and just imagining that it was so daunting, the problem was so daunting that we said, okay, we know all this information. We know um, that um, you know this is something that needs to be made visible. So I, I've drawn this map hundreds of times, and one day we just put it on top of the model. I say, well, why why don't why don't we put Overton on the Chicago map by putting the map of Chicago on uh, on the grounds of Overton? And that's what we did. Um, so we we this was an installation that was done in collaboration with multiple people. It was about learning. It was about speaking, about you know the sense of of loss, but also of like what can be done. Uh, walking the building with multiple voices. Um, so it's gathering and convening and gathering again. And um, this was an installation that is very dear to us because it became almost like a gesture. Uh, and it just enabled other activities, inviting more designers, inviting students, uh, just almost elevating the history of what had happened here. Uh, and the work, it just takes multiple, multiple forms and shapes. Um, so many design, hundreds of people have work in the spaces. And this is a building that is not up to code whatsoever. You know, we work in the spaces that we can, interior, exterior, anyone that knows, you know, how to hold a brush can come and work with us. Sometimes they're tools, sometimes it's just uh, something <clears throat> very simple, such as helping to distribute food to neighbors, especially last year during COVID, um, um, during the rise of COVID and uh, civil unrest. And uh, just imagining what other ways of, of gathering and collective learning can be enabled. 
uh, through the space. So I'm gonna just play uh, a short video here. There's only a few things that impact everyone, right? Parks, beach, lake, but schools is one of those things. It impacts everyone. If you're a kid, if you're an adult, and so when Chicago Public Schools announced that they were closing the schools and then ultimately selling the schools, I thought that this was a once in a lifetime opportunity, not only to acquire some pretty incredible real estate, but to have a real impact on community, the same way that a school once did. We are at former Anthony Overton Elementary School, future of the Overton Business and Technology Incubator. So I started doing research about the closed Chicago Public Schools that closed in 2013 and I thought it was an important call for designers like myself to have a response. The question in place was, if they're not schools anymore, what are they becoming? How can we collectively participate in this process of revitalizing closed schools. We are big fans of Paula and what she's been doing here at Anthony Overton. Repurposing the public schools that have been closed and putting them in, back into practice as a utility for the communities that they live in is really important. Photographers, civic tech folks, other artists, designers, architects, students, Everyone could be represented in this building. It's really great to see designers, architects, artists working in one space uh, collaboratively. This school is an architectural gem and absolutely you know, needs to be utilized for some public purpose. Using this beautiful architecture in the way that the classrooms work with natural light, but also with the visual connectivity across the spaces, gave us a really good framework to organize folks to think of their own theme, think of their own focus, but also expressing something that they felt important to talk about in terms of places like schools that are becoming something else. Just trying to be efficient and effective with materials and, you know, land and our earth, it's a wise thing to do. That's why this idea of like interior architecture, repurposing everything on the inside rather than creating more and more buildings that would eventually become again underutilized. And I feel like old buildings kind of tell a story that new buildings can't. A big part of it is just reinvesting in the communities because these are large vacant buildings and they really need reinvestment just to reactivate the community and make the whole city a better place to live. Pretty much. Mm -hmm. We've been thinking about what it means as architects for us to have a kind of responsibility to our communities and how we can use design to think about bringing people together. If you work in this project, is walking the talk, is really practicing some activism. And to me, that was probably the first time in which I do something like that. And I was like, this is a big opportunity. I have to be part of it. And being a, a graduate of the Chicago Public School System and you know, being a resident of this community, it's something that I, um, you know, it's personal. is personal, absolutely. We really believe that like schools are the center of communities and that they're places for neighbors and friends to come together in new ways. Everyone has the opportunity to make an impact in the built environment if we understand that we have the capacity and the power to do so. Each one of us has that capacity and, and can be amplified if it's done collectively. We're sparking fires. I think designers, our ways of advocating are really creating open doors or open door policies in a way that allows people that have something to say that might not get to say it all the time, they now have a space that they can do that. I just want to finish, um, you know, this, there's a website, creativegrounds.org, where more materials, more recent projects um, have been documented. Uh, we've been going to other schools, uh, Woods Academy, and working with other community organizations. Um, we've been continuing to work at Overton and other, like amplifying the topics, climate and cultural resilience, talking about climate change, um, and thinking how data, such as hard data, can come into spaces in a much more um, 
important way. So I want to I want to I want to stop here. Um, this is actually a slide of work in progress. Uh, we're trying to define. You know, this is the first time I show this because I think we're trying to define what are the how do we how we become more responsive and committed and are accountable and the things that we say we're invested in at Borderless. So this idea of shaping through values and principles, right, and process. So how do we how do we think of justice and resilience and agency and creativity as the core of that? Um, so I'm gonna I'm gonna stop there um, and just welcome some of the questions, Mark, that uh, some of the students um, so kindly uh, send you away. Thank you again so much for for being here with us and for sharing your work. Um, I think our students are gonna find your work so inspirational and it. Um, and so just thank you for sharing your practice with us and. Uh, I really appreciate that. We, we have a few questions that students have sent in um, and um, I, I'm curious to hear some of your thoughts on these. The, the first question is kind of in the lines of thinking about non-traditional design careers. Um, and so your practice operates slightly outside of the traditional boundaries of, a, of an architecture practice or mm -hmm. an urban design practice to some extent. And um, we had a few students who were curious um, to know more about your, your practice model, but also if you had advice for students that might want to use their architectural education in, in non-traditional mm. ways. Oh my God, that's always a hard one. <laughs> um, there's no template. I just have to lead with that. There's no template, right? I feel like what has, what, what I've shared is something that has come from opportunities to practice both in public sector, working for government, working public private practice. I worked for a private design office for multiple years. I feel like those understanding those processes and systems help me both to advance my skills as a designer, but also be critical, right? This is what I, this is how I want to practice. Um, and you know, there's no one pathway. I would say, you know, no matter what, I mean students have the opportunity to get so many experiences right in the field and i also I, the, the best thing i would recommend is find a circle of friends and mentors that can constantly help you to shape your work i think for me the commitment to collaboration comes from that space of vulnerability like i don't do anything alone if you see all the 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 portfolio projects or most of the portfolio projects are borderless they're all in collaboration and what that does is creates automatically a system of accountability. I don't, I'm not taking the decisions alone ever. And that's something that, you know, could be applied to students. I think the training, the artistic training and the architectural training is a lot about, it's, it's rooted in a lot of individual work. And honestly, some, when you are practicing is very, very, very few opportunities that you'll have, you, you'll have to, um, create the impact at scale when you operate as an individual. So, and that's not easy. It's not an easy path. You know, there, there needs to be, um, you know, like the practice of not only tolerance, but understanding, you know, what are the things that you could contribute? What are the things that uh, you don't necessarily have expertise and need someone else uh, to complement that? Um, I think the ambition and the audacity of projects comes from, multiple minds and mindsets coming to the to to respond to one thing so i would say collaborate as much as you can it's like learning how to dance right if you ever take him dance lessons you the first thing your instructor will tell you never dance with the same partner too many times because you just pick their habits and you get used to the one person so collaborate as much as you can is an exercise um, and every person is different. And therefore you'll, you'll learn how to adapt. You'll, you'll learn how to listen. You'll learn how to um, just be more responsive. I would, I would say that no matter where you go, uh, if you practice for a firm or with a firm, if you practice on your own, just try to collaborate um, as much as you can. Thank you. That's, that's really great advice for students. Um, we had another line of questions that we're sort of about um, a few questions that were kind of in the same range of, of the importance of like either preserving history or revealing history. Mm. And the idea that uh, it was interesting to me that, you know, Anthony Overton was a successful entrepreneur and when a school closes, does that history just disappear? And so I guess your thoughts about the importance of like kind of either preserving or revealing and I think your work does a lot of that. Yeah, so, you know, one of the things that we learn 
when doing all this research about close calls and having conversations with folks that would walk the hallways with us, it was one of the first things that um, CPS, Chicago Police Schools did, was remove the naming signage from the schools. Uh, and that was, you know, that's a that's an act of erasure immediately, right? So removing a name and then the renaming happen, and, you know, because we don't have policies and protocols that support um, keeping that, right? It just made me feel like we need to preserve this. This there needs to be an acknowledgement that all these generations were, um, you know, were trained here, uh, went to school here, but also a lot of the schools were named after uh, black and uh, black and brown. Um, notorious characters. So we wanted to elevate that specifically, uh, you know, this is like year three at Overton, but I still like, there's a new book I'm reading uh, that just came out last year um, that, you know, tells the story and the life of Anthony Overton. And one of the things that popped to me in that story, in that personal story, that was that his wife was a very instrumental part of his business practice. And you know this little, this building was not called the Overtons; it was called Anthony Overton. <laughs> so some of those nuances about who gets recognized because they get visibility, but on the other hand, I think understanding how to elevate legacy, elevating and making history more visible. Definitely, we would like to do this with every one of the schools um, that um, were named after. Um, definitely uh, a, a black, a black or, or brown. Um, person but also just you know going to the point of closure right like how do you how do you prevent closure from becoming erasure and i think that's a that has to be a very intentional part of the work so the last kind of questions were in the lines of of kind of the question of what can design do your work focuses so much in in neighborhoods that have seen decades of disinvestment and so how how can design really try to address these really um uh, tricky and multi-generational challenges in a way. I think expanding, uh, and the last diagram was trying to convey a little bit of that or, or create a theory around that or, or, or a framework for practice, right? So we've been prescribed very strongly what architects can and cannot do. And that, that I think is, is due to the way that our training works. What I've, we've been trying is to demonstrate that, number one, you don't have to do it all. You don't have to know how to do it all more so find the partnerships that help you to expand the work in the ways that you wanna create impact. One of the you know, requirements to come to Overton and, and work at Overton and installations or any other activation project was you need to collaborate. If you wanna do a solo show, there's so many spaces to do that. There's plenty of those. If you wanna work here, I think we have to align with the value of collaboration. Well, th thank you again so much for sharing your work. Your work is so inspirational and we appreciate you spending time with us here at COD to, um, to talk about your practice. Thanks to all of you who joined us from home and those who contributed questions in the chat. This lecture will be archived on our website at theccma.org. Just look for the Visiting Artist Series link. Our next Visiting Artist event will be a panel discussion with Aaron Wiersma, John Sabra, and Terry Conrad on Thursday, April 22nd at 11 a.m. We look forward to seeing you then.